Hello, today we're going to focus on something we haven't spent too much time on before, cost-effective legal research. It's really easy in law school to forget how expensive legal research platforms like Lexis and Westlaw can be. You can easily get in the habit of relying exclusively on these expensive legal research platforms, Lexis, Bloomberg, Westlaw, and why wouldn't you? These platforms are great. They make legal research easy, well, as easy as it can be anyway. In practice, though, you will need to be more cost conscious. It's just a fact of life. That certainly doesn't mean that you should never use Lexis, Westlaw, or Bloomberg. Your firm pays for these databases so they're available to you after all. In fact, your time, the hourly fee that clients are charged for your services, is the most expensive item that a client will find on their bill. So if you can get a more efficient answer to a legal question using Lexis, Westlaw, or Bloomberg, that efficiency is what your firm is paying Lexis and Westlaw and Bloomberg for, and you should use them to get your answer. If, on the other hand, you can incorporate free resources like the internet, free legal research platforms like the ones that are put out by the government, like GovInfo or Congress.gov, for example, and print. Don't forget about print. Print, once your firm buys a book or a set of books, then your use thereafter is free. Anyway, if you can incorporate these resources into your research plan and you can still do your legal research efficiently, everyone wins. All right, so this is our agenda for today. For the video lecture, this part of the lecture, we'll talk about some techniques for using Westlaw and Lexis, but doing it more efficiently. We'll also spend some time talking about terms and connector searching, or Boolean searching, because if you're able to master this kind of searching, you'll always retrieve fewer results, but those results will be more highly relevant than you would have returned if you used a natural language search. Natural language is just like throwing whatever terms you can think of into a search bar like we would all do if we went to Google. And finally, for the video lecture, we'll spend a little bit of time looking at FastCase. FastCase is a low-cost legal research platform that you might use rather than Lexis or Westlaw for some of your research. The reason why I mention FastCase in particular is because it's available for free with New York State Bar membership. So if you become a member of the New York State Bar, you'll also have access to FastCase. Okay, so then for the class lecture, we'll explore all sorts of different free resources that are available on the internet. I think you'll be amazed to see the resources that are available that are out there, they're credible, they're good, and they're free. All right, for now, let's spend a minute talking about how Lexis and Westlaw bill law firms. First of all, this is changing. In the past, Lexis and Westlaw charged by the hour, and everyone has always heard these horror stories about the hapless summer associate who researched something for 40 hours and ran up a $10,000 electronic research bill. Fortunately, most firms are able and do negotiate more global access now, so this doesn't really happen anymore. Mostly firms negotiate a flat monthly rate that's based on the number of attorneys using the platform and probably based on the use during the last few years. So if they're using it a lot, the fee will be a little bit higher. If they don't use it so much, the fee will be a little bit lower. Keep in mind that firms may choose not to pay to access all of the individual Lexis and Westlaw databases that you're familiar with here under our BLS academic subscription. We have a lot here under the academic subscription. Smaller firms and solo practitioners might also choose to pay per search or by the hour. So not every firm still has one of these global flat fee arrangements. So it's good to keep that in mind and obviously something that you need to know before you make a research plan. So why do we care about this? Assuming that most firms have these unlimited use per monthly charge plans now, even if your firm's paying one of these kind of flat rates, you still need to worry about using cost-effective techniques because, as I mentioned, some resources may not be available under your firm's flat rate plan. So if you need to go into those databases, you need to know how to do it efficiently. And these out-of-plan charges tend to be very expensive. Also, the flat rate that your firm pays, as I mentioned a little bit before, so the flat rate that you're paying in the next year is largely going to be dependent on how much resources that your firm used in that platform in the current year. So if associates are inefficient and running up lots of electronic research charges, the flat rate's going to go up for the next year, which is going to make everybody unhappy, of course. Now we're going to just talk about recovery, which basically that's a kind of a legal billing term of art. How do you get the money back that's going out the door in law firms? When I started practicing electronic research costs, Lexis and Westlaw almost always appeared as a separate charge on the client's bill. 
Then Klein started complaining about this charge back when they got a little bit more power and the economy went bad. And these fees for electronic research always seemed to bother them more than attorney time. And I'm not sure why, because the attorney time component was far larger than the electronic research, but they just didn't like paying for electronic research. So separate charging and cost recovery for electronic research is becoming less and less common. And before you start crying for all the poor law firms, though, all this means is that the firm is just incorporating the cost of electronic research into the hourly fee that they charge the clients for attorney time. The clients just aren't seeing the cost as a separate item on their bill anymore. So they're still recovering the cost. They're just kind of doing it in a different way. All right, so let's move on from how Westlaw and Lexis price their research and how firms try to recover the cost of that research. And let's move into the nuts and bolts of how you can be more efficient with your research when you use these platforms. After all, efficient research means that you're saving both time and money, which is good for your clients, your firm, and you. The first tip is to develop a research plan before you sign on to Westlaw or Lexis. This is going back to what we talked about in the first class, which is to take some time and think through what you're going to do before you actually start doing it and before you actually sign on to do your research, plan it out. Consider the facts presented to you and try and figure out what legal issue or issues need to be solved. Use the internet, print secondary sources, and your assigning partner or peers to help you issue spot. All of this is free. And also before signing on, figure out if you can, what is the applicable jurisdiction? This way you can do a narrow search in just federal cases, for example, or New York statutes, if that's where it is, rather than running a broad search across the Westlaw landing page of everything and getting back thousands of results, many of which won't even be relevant to the question you're trying to research. So next, if you have a citation to anything, you know, if there's a client letter and they're asking a question, if there's a memorandum from a regulator and they're saying your client violated a certain regulation, or if there's a case that you're trying to respond to in a complaint, use that to start your research. So use that to get your answer. Hopefully through this class you now know how to take a statute and then use the notes of decision and shepherds and key sites to get cases and administrative materials interpreting the statute. You hopefully also know now how to take a case if that's what you have and use the key number system and the citing references to get more cases, statutes and regulations that are on point with your issue. You can even use these methods to get secondary resources if you need help finding additional primary law or even if you just need help finding out what the primary law is saying. Remember that's always a good thing to do is go to the statute, get a secondary resource that's citing to the statute, and then take advantage of the experts out there that have written on this to help you understand what the statute is saying. And then you can use the same methods to go get additional primary law to cite to the court or to help answer your corporate client's question or to write the letter back to the regulator and explain why your client did not, in fact, violate that regulation. All right, so as I said earlier, don't run a general Google-like search from Lexus or Westlaw from the landing page if you can figure out how to run a narrow search. It's better to get 20 highly relevant results than 300 results that may or may not help you solve your issue. So take advantage of those filters on Lexus and Westlaw. Even if you start with a broad search because you're afraid you're going to miss something, and that happens sometimes, and it's okay. Use the filters afterward, though, and the search within box after you get your search results to narrow down your answer. And then keep in mind that on Lexis and Westlaw, you can save your results. I use folders all the time. I have so many folders set up on both Lexis and Westlaw of different research projects that I've worked on or that I'm working on. Even if I think the research project's complete, I want to be able to go back to it again later. And why not? It's free. It doesn't cost anything to set up a folder. The other thing Lexis and Westlaw do is they keep extensive histories of your searches and your results. So if you forgot to put it in a folder, you forgot to save it, you can view your history for free on Westlaw for a whole year and for 90 days on Lexis. And then also keep in mind that if you're in, say, a treatise or you're in any kind of secondary resource with the table of contents or index, you can view those and browse them for free. So you can go ahead and look at the table of contents in the index and see does it have something, that particular resource that's going to help you before you start paying any money. That helps you to just not run multiple keyword searches in the same source. You can just go and look at those table of contents like you would if you were looking at a book. So let's take a look at the way that this works, some of the things that I just talked about. I talked about it, now I'm going to show it to you. So here on Westlaw, you can see there right at the top, there's your folders, there's your history. Here on Lexis, you just go, there's your history, and then you drop down the more tab to get to folders. And here's those filters that I was talking about. So I have a bunch of results here. I did a very broad search, sex-based discrimination. But if I use 
the search within. So I did sex-based discrimination, but now I narrowed it down to say that I want it to be mentioning the phrase academic institution, and then it's going to give me much more highly relevant results. I'm not missing anything. I start seeing what's there in the 29,000 results, and I realize I have no desire to read 29,000 documents. So I come up with a way to get them more relevant and fewer at the same time. Here I am on Westlaw. You can see it's the same sort of idea here. There's all these filters over on the left that you can use after, and there's that search within results. And I find this to be a very effective tool, this search within results, because I've already got this kind of pile of relevant results, and now I'm going to make it even more relevant by coming up with an additional keyword combination. Okay, so moving on from our focus on just exclusively Lexis and Westlaw, here's another really good tip for saving some money when you're conducting legal research, and that is use the internet, but only up to a certain point. I still do this with almost every legal research problem that I come across because it's just my habit from when I was a practicing lawyer. Use the internet to learn how lawyers are talking about a particular area of the law. What are their terms of art? How do they frame the issues? Who are the regulators? And who are the other big players in the area that you need to go and research? Reading this kind of background information on the internet also allows you to determine if it's New York regulations or federal case law that's likely to give you your answer. That way you can focus your energies on these particular databases when you get to Lexis or Westlaw. You can also run as many searches as you want for free on Google and see what search terms seem to lead you to the best information. And then you can take those search terms and plug them into Lexis or Westlaw when you get there. So you can see that you can do a little bit of pre-research and then you're more efficient when you get to the paid databases. So after you've done that pre-research and when you get onto Westlaw or Lexis, you can use the platforms not to issue spot, not to figure out jurisdiction, not to run 10 or 15 searches to get your answer. Instead, you'll use the platforms for what they can do that other resources cannot. Things like head notes and key numbers, shepherds and key sites. You're not going to find those on Google. You're not going to find them on any free resource, actually. All right, so just the last few tips. Do find out how your firm pays for its legal research. If the firm's paying per hour, you're going to use Lexis and Westlaw differently than if your firm pays a flat rate. So you need to know that almost from before you ever sign on to the platform on your first day of work. Also, make sure you take advantage of the tutorials and the research attorneys that are available on Lexis and Westlaw. They're both excellent and they're both free. Okay, so that's it for pricing in Lexis and Westlaw and how we can do searching more efficiently. Now we're going to move on to another topic that's near and dear to my heart and certainly is a way to increase your efficiency as a legal researcher, and that is to use Boolean searching. What is that? Boolean searching is a search method that allows re legal researchers to return fewer but more highly relevant results. Put it another way, you'll have fewer results to sort through and your results will be more likely to answer your legal question. So it's great. Boolean search methods can be used on Westlaw, Lexis, Bloomberg, and as I mentioned before, even on the internet. When you construct a Boolean search, you're telling the database that you're searching for only those results that meet the parameters that you set. So if you say you want only results that mention negligent and driver, you're going to end up getting automobile accident cases only rather than the whole world of cases talking about negligence and other contexts. Fewer results, but more highly relevant to what you're trying to accomplish. All right, so let's take a look at some of the operators and the terms and connectors that we can use to construct a Boolean search. If you put a series of words in quotes, you're telling the database retrieve documents containing only that exact phrase. So you have to be careful that you know what you're doing with that because you have to get the exact phrase that you want and sometimes you don't know how a statute or a case is going to phrase something. But if you're sure that's what you want, then put it in quotes and it will retrieve only documents that have that exact phrase appearing in that exact order. The explanation point, you see it up there in my negligence, is a root expander. So if I put BIT explanation point, I'm telling the database to retrieve anything BIT with anything after it. So it's going to get bite, bites, biting, bitten. Then there's this universal character. Don't use it as often, but if, for instance, you didn't care if you got woman or women, you could put that universal character, which is the star, the asterisk, in, and it would retrieve anything that had W-O-M, anything in. So now let's try doing some Boolean searching with something you guys are actually all familiar with. And is something that you use all the time. Obviously, you could put dog and bite, and so you're going to at least get documents that have all of those, but it's really more effective to use in combination with some of these other operators and terms and connectors that we have. So, for example, if I were 
doing what you had all done when you were doing the scaffold case, I could put in the phrase labor law 240 and recalcitrant worker. So I'm only going to get cases that are talking about um, the recalcitrant worker in the context of a labor law 240 case. Or retrieves documents with one or another search term, which is not so useful on its own, but again, it is useful if you put it in connection with other terms and connectors. So again, I'm going to do labor law 240 and, and now I'm putting in parentheses. So I'm telling that I, I want it to say labor law 240 and it has to say either sole proximate cause as a phrase or recalcitrant worker. So it's going to bring up those that, that mention labor law 240 and the phrase sole proximate cause and it's also going to bring up the cases that mention labor law 240 and recalcitrant worker. So it'll give me both because maybe I want to look at both of those things. So that's another one to keep in mind. This at least number retrieves only those documents that include the word that you're putting there at least blank number of times. Make sure you keep this all kind of smashed together when you do this. At least five sole proximate cause means that that term that I put in there, sole proximate cause, is going to appear at least five times, which means that it's playing a pretty big role in the court's analysis. It's not just mentioned once. These next two I use constantly, almost every search I do. So slash P retrieves documents that have both search words that you're giving within a single paragraph. So labor law 240 within a paragraph of damages. Slash S means it's retrieving documents with both search terms appearing in a single sentence. So scaffold within a sentence of fall. It's going to retrieve only if those two words are in the same sentence. And you can keep going on and on and on. You can connect as many words as you want in a, in a single search. Again, getting more and more relevant as you go along. And then slash number retrieves documents with two search words appearing within a certain number of each other. So proximate within three words of cause in any order. So cause can appear before proximate or proximate before cause, but they have to be within three words of each other in the document that the database is going to retrieve for you. So let's go back all the way back to the first class where we had that senior partner that was going on his wine buying spree in Napa, California, and he wanted to know if he could ship his wine home to Brooklyn or whether it was going to violate either New York State or California law. So in terms of Boolean, you can think of this acronym that we have, ITAC. You have to think of issues, you have to think of terms, then you have to think of alternatives, and then you need to think of connectors. And these are the four things that you need to think of to construct a Boolean search. So let's look at those. I'm doing this for you this time, but then you guys can do it yourself when we get to class and, and practice doing ITAC on your own so you can get good at this. So what was the issue? The issue was, does New York law allow the senior partner to have the wine shipped directly from Napa to his home in Brooklyn? So now we have to search for it. That's, and now we know what we need to answer. How are we going to answer it? Here's some terms that I came up with. Wine, shipment, direct, customer, interstate, and laws. So those are the terms that I'm going to put in some kind of format using some sort of connectors and proximity to find my answer. But terms are not enough. You have to come up with some alternative terms as well to search for so you don't miss anything important. So here are some alternative terms that I came up with. And now I have all of that. Now I've got to come up with my connectors. So I would use, once I came up with all this, I'd go to either Lexis or Westlaw. I'd make sure that I selected New York either cases, statutes, or secondary sources, depending on where I was in the process. And I would go ahead and put in, I changed it now to three, because I decide direct shipment is not going to be five words apart within a sentence of wine. And there's the exact search that I did in Westlaw. And you can see right away, it's pulling up all those relevant results that we found the first day of class. If I want to go ahead and see, is there a statute out there? Because ultimately, that's the place that I want to get to. Right away, the statute that we found the first day, it's the very first thing that appears. So that's pretty great. And again, that is the beauty of Boolean searching. Fewer results, but more highly relevant. Your results are likely to be up at the top. So you're going to end up being a lot more efficient and looking at the right resources from the very beginning. So that's why I think you should spend some time learning how to do Boolean searching. That being said, Lexis and Westlaw have gotten much better with natural language searching. So if this is just something that you never become comfortable with, you can do natural language searching in these databases. And obviously, you can do it on the internet. Google's really good at it. But it's a good thing to know. And if you can do both, obviously, you're only in better shape. All right, let's move on now to fast case. So here is a list that talks about the legal research platforms that are available for free to people who are members of their state bar. And here we are in New York. So if you click on that, 
it's telling us from the State Bar Association website that if you're a member, you receive free and unlimited access to basically the New York libraries in FastCase. All right, let's just spend a minute talking about FastCase. Like the other legal research platforms that you're familiar with, FastCase allows natural language or Boolean searching like we just discussed. The one thing to kind of notice is that you'll probably be limited to just federal resources and New York law if you're getting it through the New York State Bar Association. Here in BLS, you have access to other state resources as well. Some other things, it's not as rich as Westlaw Lexis or Bloomberg as far as the finding aids, key numbers, annotations, headnotes, and it's only got limited secondary sources, although this is getting better, and they're incorporating more and more secondary sources that you can do an overall search and get those sources along with primary law. So it's getting better as time goes on. So one thing that is important and I really want to highlight, as I mentioned, I practiced as a solo practitioner for a while, and I kind of was able to figure out how to do most things using free or low-cost resources. The one Thing that I could never figure out how to do and I still don't think you can do today other than by using Lexis or Westlaw is updating your primary law. Updating it with enough confidence that you can cite it to a client, to a partner, to a judge. So FastCase has come up with this sort of halfway system that it calls authority check and really the way that authority check works is it's just doing machine learning and it's using AI to search decisions for the language that would show that a cited decision has been overturned or reversed so you know when you cite according to the blue book if a case has been overturned you need to note that in your citation so that's what FastCase does it goes and it searches for that sort of reversed overturned that kind of language and then it note that with this thing called the bad law bot that there's something going on with that case. So it's useful, although I'm not sure that I would rely on it if I were citing a case to a court. But well, let's take a look and see how fast case does this. So I use the sort of seminal overturned case that you think of, which is Plessy versus Ferguson, that Brown versus the Board of Education did in fact overrule. So here you can see there's a red flag. So Fast case is letting us know there's a problem. And then you can look over here and see the cases that have cited to Plessy versus Ferguson, the total number of cases, and then 21 sites are noting that there's something wrong with this case. And you can look down here and see what they're seeing, which is the words overruled by Brown versus Board of Education. So there you go. That's how it works. That's how fast case would let us know that there's a problem with a case. So here's what the landing page looks like on fast case. And it gives you a different ways to search. You can do a case law search, you could do statutes, regulations, you could search court rules, pick your jurisdiction. If you're a bar member, you'll only have New York, but here you'd have to choose that you wanted to search New York. And now I'm going to do a Boolean search, labor law 240 within five of sole proximate cause. Here's my results list. If I click on this tab and say results, then I can choose to sort them in a different way. And what I find really helpful when I do fast case, I'm going to sort them by telling fast case, I want to appear at the top of my list, that case that was cited the most by all of the other cases that are appearing in this results list. So if there's 68 cases that I got in return to my search, I want to find the one that those 68 cases cited the most, which one was cited the most often. All right, so now let's assume I want to look at the Blake case in fast case. So I click on the link and there you see it is. And then I can do the same kind of things that I could do in Westlaw or Lexis, save it, can print it, can add it to a folder or I can email it. And now there's another interesting thing that you wanna look at. If you're looking at a case, you'd wanna click on this authority check, which is what we were talking about in the beginning. And here now is this graphic of all of the cases that have cited to Blake. And the different sizes of the circles show how often that case, the citing case, has been cited itself. So if I click on that one, that's Cahill. So Cahill has cited to Blake, and Cahill itself has been cited many times. That's why it's a big circle. So that kind of helps me to see how these cases are related, which ones are important by the size of the circle. In a nutshell, it's an easy way to find additional relevant authority. FastCase also has another helpful feature called Foresight. 
Foresight points you to all the cases that are related to your search but don't have your exact search terms. This can help you to discover some interesting and relevant cases that you might otherwise have missed. So here I'm going to search for labor law 240 within the same sentence as maintenance. Say I was researching that whole repair versus maintenance issue under labor law 240. And Fast Cases Foresight is telling me to take a look at these cases even though they're not responsive to my search query. Foresight usually works pretty well. As you can see, these are three good Court of Appeals cases highly relevant to the issue of repair versus maintenance under Labor Law 240. All right, so let's wrap up Fast Case now just by looking at one last thing. We have a known statute. We want to look at Labor Law 240. So we're going to browse to the statute that we need. So we start out on the landing page, search statutes. Then we go to browse rather than doing a keyword search, which we could also do. And then here I've kind of just worked my way down just like I would on Lexis or Westlaw to Labor Law 240. Click on it and then it appears, you can see over there, the full text of the statute on the right hand side. All right, that's it for Fast Case. Let's wrap up this video lecture by talking about how do you evaluate free and cost effective resources to decide whether they're worth it or not. All right, so we talked a little bit in the beginning and now we'll talk a little bit more to kind of wrap things up here. When you're using free resources, you really have to be careful. You have to know whether the source is reliable and current, otherwise you're obviously not saving anybody anything if you're relying on a statute that's been amended or abrogated or case law that's been overturned or just isn't relevant anymore. And you probably learned something about evaluating resources when you were an undergrad and you first started doing term papers and stuff where you had to rely on resources. The basic idea is to be a skeptic about everything you read until you satisfy yourself that you can trust the source. One test you can use is this CRAAP test. So the mnemonic is C-R-A-A-P, and you can kind of evaluate these factors one by one in your head or keep the little card around if it helps when you're trying to evaluate free resources. Currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. And I'll let you read that yourself. We don't have time to go through this in detail now, but it's pretty clear. And it's good to have a system when you're evaluating sources, particularly when you're a legal researcher and the stakes are so high. So if you're on Lexis or Westlaw, you can feel pretty comfortable about credibility if you're looking at a free resource on the internet, you have to be more careful. Is it some random attorney that may not understand the intricacies of the law that they're writing about? And that absolutely happens. There's self-proclaimed experts out there. doesn't necessarily mean they know what they're talking about or they're citing the correct law or they're interpreting the law correctly that they are citing. So keep in mind that your time is very expensive to your clients. Usually you're going to be billed out at a few hundred dollars an hour. Sometimes you can get to a legal question in half the time using a paid database like Lexis or Westlaw. And in those cases, you should use the paid database. Absolutely. Your firm wants you to do that and so do your clients. Save the free resources for those instances when you can use them efficiently. And hopefully this lecture has given you an idea of when those instances are. It's kind of when you're doing a combination type thing and you're trying to do issue spotting or figure out jurisdiction or terms of art or it's when you already have in mind exactly what you want. So if you know that there's a particular provision of the U.S. code that you want to look at, there's no reason that you need to go on Lexis and Westlaw if you have an expensive plan there. Instead, you can easily go to GovInfo or the Office of Law Revision Council website, which provide the U.S. Code, and get that provision for free. And we'll talk more about that in the in-class lecture. That's it for the video lecture. Don't forget to take our last quiz, which is the Week 11 quiz, and submit your results. I'll see you in class.